Hello, everyone. As uh, people who regularly follow theological debates and discussions online, I'm sure almost all of us, all of you, are familiar with, you know, a whole host of arguments for and against what, what I would call the absolute sinlessness of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So it's not really my intention in this video to relitigate the most prominent among those arguments. But what I do want to do in this video is explore a train of logic that I haven't really seen all that much, hasn't really been represented all that much, at least in popular circles. And in my view, it not only provides an excellent argument in support of the sinlessness of Mary, but I think it helps to further contextualize this doctrine within the logic of the Paschal Mystery of Jesus Christ. And um, and I think that also has spiritual benefits um, the more we meditate on that. But in order to do that, we have to establish, I think, a foundational premise about the Paschal Mystery itself before we go on to making that argument. Uh, but before we make that argument, um, if you like what I do, um, if you like this video, if you end up agreeing with it or liking it, uh, give it a like. It helps the algorithm. And please comment what you think. Uh, what, what do you think about the sinlessness of Mary? Uh, what do you think about this argument that I'm presenting? Uh, what arguments do you think are valuable or, or not helpful? You know, It's great to get that kind of discussion going on. And if you want to support what I do, you can become a patron, patreon.com slash classical theist. Great way to support my work. Uh, and, and, you know, you get uh, unlimited Q&A access with me, um, you know, through the messaging system, uh, monthly articles, monthly book recommendations, um, periodic exclusive uh, streams, and also video requests. So you can request that I make content on a particular area of your interest or on a specific question or you want me to react to something i'll do that so link to that in the description great way to support my work um okay so, so what is that foundational premise about the paschal mystery itself uh, before we go on to making that argument about the sinlessness of mary well that foundational premise and this is something that we all have to agree with is that it was perfectly, in other words uh, the paschal mystery of jesus christ the sacrifice that he made is perfectly efficacious in what it sought out to accomplish. You know, as the prophet Isaiah says, um, for as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that proceeds from my mouth, or so shall my word be that proceeds from my mouth. It shall not return void, but it shall accomplish that which I intend and prosper and that for which I sent it. Now, of course, we can understand the efficacy of Christ's passion in a number of different ways. Um, for even without the sinlessness of the Blessed Virgin, we would still rightly affirm its perfect efficacy. Um, you know, and that's because it contained within itself the power to take away all sin and to reconcile humanity perfectly with divinity. Um, so in consideration of the absolute efficacy of Christ's passion, I, of course, would readily concede that the sinlessness of the Blessed Virgin does nothing to take away from the force of that teaching. But there is another sense in which we can talk about the efficacy of Christ's passion and you know, Paschal mystery. That is, not, not in its intrinsic power, but in its consequent effects. So the consequent effects of the antecedently efficacious work of Christ's passion. That is, whether it can truly be said that the divinely intended goal for which Christ suffered and died was ever instantiated in a manner that's fully commensurate with how God antecedently desired for it to be accomplished. In other words, can we point to any instance, specifically any person, for whom it can be said that the redemptive work of Christ accomplished its fruits perfectly and without any residue. And if not, then what does it say about the fittingness of the divine plan of salvation? And, and how can we really make sense of this in light of what was taught by the prophet Isaiah? In other words, if we cannot point to at least one shining example 
where the redemptive seed of Christ is planted without any resistance or imperfect reception whatsoever in the recipient, then how can it really be said that the sacrifice of of Christ is perfectly efficacious in a manner commensurate with the superabundant generosity of the Savior. The human race and their and the cosmos more broadly, therefore, needs, in my view, a crowned jewel, as it were, to perfectly and and, and specific and concretely represent in its you know feminine, purely creaturely capacity. It was the Immaculate Spouse of Christ without spot or wrinkle. It has to be able to represent that, 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 that receptive capacity to, to take in the redemptive fruits of Christ without any imperfection. The human race, human, human race um, needs to be represented in in that way, and then the Blessed Virgin fulfills this role to a T. And you know, to anyone who might find it odd that the Mother of Christ also stands as, um, as as like a concrete microcosm of His Bride, you might want to consider carefully the words of Saint Albert the Great, who says, you know, speaking of the birth of Christ, quote. He came forth like a bridegroom from the bridal chamber of the virgin's womb. When he was born from Mary, he did not violate her as mother. Rather, he loved her as bride, consecrating her as bride without spot or wrinkle. Unquote. Um, in, in this sense, the, the, whole, the whole mystery of the Annunciation, it takes on an entirely fresh mystical meaning. Instead of just being about the Virgin's role as the mother of our Lord according to the flesh, on a deeper and more mystical level, on a more foundational level, the Annunciation is really more of a marriage proposal at that higher mystical plane where the Virgin, the Blessed Virgin, supremely and maximally represents in her own immaculate person the whole rest of the order of creation that's meant to participate in this spousal relationship with the Logos for the rest of eternity to receive fully the redemptive fruits that Christ had to offer in his passion. She stands midway between Christ and the rest of the mystical body. And as the, the high point, and this is, this is an analogy that we might use, you know, as a high point of a pyramid, you know, it, it virtually contains all that's beneath the pyramid, so does the Blessed Virgin, likewise, virtually contain within herself all the merit and grace that can be conceivably received by the rest of the order of creation. So, as, as such, she receives within her soul, as, as the glory of Jerusalem, as, as is foretold in the Old Testament, all merit and all grace that Christ had to offer in his suffering, passion, and death. And and also you know so intimately shared by her. In, in in the sorrows of her own heart. So because of her, nothing, absolutely nothing, was wasted in what Christ had to offer the human race, and only because of her. And because she received the fullness of all he had to offer in his sacrifice, she takes on this new and more highly exalted form of motherhood as the new Eve, you know, the mother of all who are now incorporated into Christ, and so really fulfilling that namesake as the true mother of all the living. And this is why I think it was most fitting for her to be utterly without sin from the moment of her conception until the end of her natural life and throughout the rest of eternity. Yes, of course, it was fitting for her to be conceived without sin in order to be a fit dwelling place for the incarnate Logos, um, fulfilling her typological role as the Ark of the New Covenant, but this was to fulfill her role according to the flesh. And as we just got done saying, you know, there remains a higher, a more mystical role for her to fulfill. 
and that is to be a perfect microcosm, you know, a, a maximally perfect and, and, and concrete, because not enough to be abstract, a concrete expression of the spousal love that Christ wanted his beloved to return to him in exchange for his redemptive merits won for us on the cross. It is the Blessed Virgin on this view who fulfills this role for us on our behalf and as a result of this, this is what what serves as the basis for this co-mediation that she fulfills with uh, Christ in the distribution of all graces that he has to offer. And so to miss out on this mariological dimension of Christian soteriology, I think really is to impoverish not only your theology, but also your spirituality. And, and so I hope this was kind of a helpful way of framing the sinlessness of Mary. I hope it gave you kind of a, 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 a new uh, vantage point from which to look at it. And, you know, if you found it helpful, give this video a like. And if you do want to support my work, you can you can consider joining my, my Patreon, patreon.com slash classicaltheist. Um, God bless you.